Hello, everyone. Happy New Year, and welcome to the Penn Museum. You're used to Steve Tinney here. I am not Steve Tinney. My name is Dan Rahimi, and I'm executive director for galleries here at the museum. I occasionally get to fill in for Steve, um, who is our deputy director and chief curator who normally introduces this series. And I'm very pleased tonight um, to welcome you and to, to tonight's lecture, A Home for Our Stuff, Building the Penn Museum by Dr. Anne Blair Brownlee. This is the first great stuff. <laughs> it's kind of funny, great stuff. Is, uh, <laughs> I all say of the museum, you know, Disney might have great films and can do great interactives, but we have great stuff, you know. Um, this is the first of the year, and you may wish to add to your calendars our next talk, which is on February 6th, which is called The Stuff of Life, Animal Remains, by Dr. Catherine Moore, our charismatic archaeozoologist in the Center for the Analysis of Archaeological Materials. Dr. Moore will talk about the significance of animal bone in the museum's collections with some very surprising insights and really cool stories about those collections. Tonight's lecture is entitled, A Home for Our Stuff, Building the Penn Museum. And there is no one who could tell that story better than Dr. Ann Brownlee. Dr. Brownlee is an archaeologist and art historian who specializes in the pottery of ancient Greece. She serves as associate curator in the Mediterranean section here in the museum, and she teaches in the history of art department in the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> Dr. Brownlee received her PhD at Harvard, where she wrote about Attic black-figured Dinoi. Dinoi are those wonderful round bowls which the Greeks mixed wine and water in, um, and we have some in our collection. She's written extensively about this type of Greek pottery and is currently working on the publication of Attic black figure pottery from the Etruscan city of Orvieto. She's also co-director of the museum's Corpus Vasorum Antiquorum, which is an international project, it's a very old one. Many, many volumes have been published in this series that catalogs the great collections of ancient vases, really collection by collection all across the world. Dr. Brownlee was co-curator of our permanent galleries on the third floor from the Etruscan, Greek, and Roman collections, which I'm sure you all know very well, and they opened in 2003. And I wonder if it was during this beautiful renovation project that she refined her interest in the history of the building of the museum. Um, because that's a junction of old buildings and new buildings here. Um, a couple of years later, as many of you know, the museum began its ambitious and prescient renovation beneath the original entrance and the fish pond, uh, where 21,000 square feet were redeveloped to provide air conditioning for future renovations and expansions. And Anne served as the museum's project manager and wrote quite a lot about that. I say it's prescient because <clears throat> right now, as we're redeveloping the Cox and Harrison wings right next door to us, we're drawing uh, HVAC from that renovation and it's coming under the building and over to the new building and it's much more complicated than we thought. I and mean, the facilities are there, but it's really hard to route these great ductwork uh, lines under and between the existing buildings. Now on a personal note, I, I came to the museum four years ago to begin work on the renewal of the museum's galleries. And as I was being oriented to the museum and as finding my way, everyone told me that I had to get hold of the Brownlee Report. Well, what's the Brownlee Report? <laughs> It turns out that it's a three-volume work called The Historic Structure Report, 2005, written by Anne Brownlee, Jeffrey Cohn, and Sean Evans. I've consulted it many times since Anne first very kindly gave it to me, and I've learned how many coats of shellac were required for the 1899 woodwork. <laughs> to me, that's very interesting, and the answer is four, four coats of shellac. <laughs> far more than you would get today, I assure you. Um, I learned that the brass handrails on the great marble stairs are not original to that staircase. They were added 20 or 30 years later, and I was disappointed to learn that, but that was good. 
And I also learned that there's a great mystery about some missing marble spheres from those same staircases. But I'm not here to tell stories. We're here tonight to listen to Dr. Brownlee, who will answer questions afterward. And I think we'll have a microphone coming around to, if you do have a question at the end. So please welcome, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ann Brownlee. Thank you very much, Dan, for that lovely introduction. And indeed, it was um, working on the reinstallation of those galleries that got me interested in the history of the building. The architect that we work with, that we worked with, um, the lovely now late Charlie Evers, um, uh, and I wrote an article about the the history of the galleries, and uh, that was really what got me started. So I, I owe it I owe it to Charlie. All right, so the building of the Penn Museum, building the Penn Museum, I went back and forth, yes, is the story of our building, but as you'll see, it's also the story of our institution. And this evening, as we look at the complex building history of the museum, we'll also be considering the institution, often a changing institution, that still dwells within that structure. And the museum building as we know it, now was built over a period of more than 100 years. So let's do a brief um, uh, chronological survey um, with the assistance of some very good um, uh, aerial photography. So um, the earliest part of the building opened in December of 1899 and that's uh, the part circled there. Um, then it was followed by the Harrison Wing with a rotunda in Harrison Auditorium, and that was between 1911 and 1916, and was named for Charles Custis Harrison, the university provost and also head of the museum's board of managers. So that was followed by the Cox Wing, 1922 to 1926, named for the very generous supporter of our Egyptian expeditions, Eckley Brinton Cox, Jr. The administrative wing, which we also call the Sharp Wing, and I realized as I was reading through this that I call it both, so sorry about that. Its official name is the uh, administrative wing. Um, <clears throat> but we call it the Sharp Wing after the Sharp Gallery on the third floor. And that wing opened in 1929. There was a long hiatus until the academic wing opened in 1971. Work began in 67, opened in 71. Then the main wearing wing, named for ex the extraordinary Penn Museum donors, Peggy and Bruce Mainwaring, which opened in 2002. So that's the, um, uh, the sort of quick history most of you probably know this already, but just to remind you, and it is the, this complexity, which is certainly part of the story. Okay, now that we know where we're going, um, some acknowledgments. Um, I owe thanks to a good many architects, engineers, contractors, and museum staff who have, over the years, taught me so much about this building. And I especially thank uh, museum archivist Alex Pizzotti. And very, very special thanks to Sean Evans of the architectural firm Atkin Olsen Shade and Jeffrey Cohen, Bryn Mawr College, who were the co-authors with me, they actually did most of it, of the historic structure report um, on the building that Dan just mentioned. And you see it here, um, big binders, um, illustrations down below, and all the folders, many of the folders, um, um, that, that we used uh, to um, gather together the enormous amounts of material. Um, I just, I did a quick count. There are 800 drawings for this building. It's over 100 years, it's a long time to accumulate them. So um, it was a massive undertaking. And um, actually I'd forgotten how many coats of shellac um, uh, were involved, so I'm gonna have to read it again more carefully. 
Finally, I'd like to thank um, Penn History of Art Professor David Brownlee, Sean, Jeff, and David will all recognize bits of themselves, perhaps some quite large bits, in what I'm about to talk about. And it has been over the years a pleasure and really a privilege to have learned from all of these people about this building. Now our story begins, of course, in 1887 when the museum was founded. Soon after that, in the 1890s, the museum collection was housed in purpose-built spaces in the newly completed University Library by Frank Furness, which opened in 1881, 1891, sorry, which you see here um, in its, uh, the way it looked uh, when it opened. But ultimately, collections were pretty much everywhere. From the ground floor that you see on the left, which is where the Ross Gallery holds its lovely receptions, um, on one of the upper floors, and filling the staircase on the way. The third floor galleries were stuffed with our stuff, as it were, so overcrowded they looked like little more than storage rooms. You never see any people in these photos, by the way. Anyway, this took a few years, by the way, since these photos were, were made about 1898. Clearly the museum needed a new building, but where would it go? In 1894, a site was acquired from the city, and that land was part of the vast holdings of what you see here, the Blockley Alms House. Rather romantically shown here. Uh, there's really not much that's romantic about an alms house, but anyway. And it's shown here not too long after its relocation from Center City in 1829, with its central block by the architect William Strickland. Now in this map, and I think you can see it pretty clearly, um, you can see the sp sprawling complex is here. So here's the river, here is Franklin Field, here is South Street and the bridge, here's the Blockley Alms House. Um, it's basically on the site of, for some of you old Philadelphians, um, the Philadelphia General Hospital. It's of course all been taken over now by Penn Research and Chop Research Buildings, by the VA and so on. Anyway, so. You can see here that the Alms House was surrounded by open areas, shown in green, um, Woodland Cemetery, of course, but also proposed park, and up here it says Botanical Garden. And here's a close-up of that area, and again, you can see it says Botanical Garden, and that, of course, is ultimately our site. Now, the city had designated the area as a public park in 1883, but it was not realized so that in the 1890s, the area on both sides of the railroad and along the river was used as a dump. Indeed, the east side of the tract was particularly problematic. It was said that most of it had been a dumping ground for years. This is looking um, um, basically from College Hall across the South Street Bridge. The refuse formed a steep, rugged slope to the railroad track. Goats roamed over it, feeding here and there on the scanty green patches among the ash heaps. And broken bricks and old shoes were strewn over the uneven surface. This is from a, um, a contemporary account. In fact, a biography of uh, William Pepper, the man on the left. Two people, William Pepper and Sarah York Stevenson, well described as the museum's founders, took over the leadership of the museum to build a building and to acquire collections to fill it. They had their work cut out for them as we see them out on the site with what we would now call a development prospect. One gray March day in, 19, in 1894, Dr. Pepper and Mrs. Stevenson, and this is an account from Pepper's biography, with Mr. Justice C. Strawbridge, of Strawbridge and Clothier, whom they were anxious to interest in the project, this is 94, and to whom they wished to show the new land, met by appointment at the end of the South Street Bridge. Now remember, the Schuylkill River was still a working river, with industries and railroads on both sides. So the view out across the river was perhaps not exactly what one would wish. And a strong wind 
<clears throat> sorry, a strong east wind blew from the river and the whole outlook was hopelessly dismal. Mr. Strawbridge stood looking over the dreary waste while Dr. Pepper enthusiastically explained the glorious possibilities offered to his view by the wretched stretch of land before them. With each passing train, a dense black smoke rolled up in sooty masses, enveloping railroad tracks, goats, goats, and refuse in a black mist, whilst blasts of coal gas smothered the lungs of the visitors. Mr. Strawbridge gravely listened to Dr. Pepper's vivid description. He even nodded in courteous approval as the complete plan at an estimated cost of over two millions of dollars was explained to him, but his face wore a perplexed expression. As Dr. Pepper turned away for a moment to call the attention of a passing policeman to trespassers, Mr. Strawbridge whispered to his companion, Sarah York Stevenson, I cannot bear to throw cold water on Dr. Pepper's enthusiasm, but what an extraordinary sight for a great museum. Of course, I would like to help him, but what a sight. <laughs> the western end of the site posed problems also in that several buildings were still in active use by the almshouse and they would have to be demolished. And you see, um, here, see them here on the left, um, the, uh, the house and what's actually a barn. And further, further east, facing South Street, was a public bathhouse. So those buildings belonged to the almshouse, but this was, a, this was a public bathhouse. And you see it there in what is the only picture of it. Sorry, you can't see much of it. It was erected in 1885. This free public swimming pool was enormously popular, as is evident in its astonishing attendance figures. 153,589, and I call them bath visits because they're probably repeat visitors, during June to September, its season in 1895. More than half of the bathhouse would be covered by the new museum building, so it had to be demolished. But in April of 1897, as the buildings were set to be demolished and museum construction begun, Edward W. Patton, the member of the city's select council representing the 27th Ward, wrote to Pepper to see if part of the bath could be saved. Pepper, past master at dealing with politicians, wrote, make the people understand that it could not be spared. We are going to spend over a million dollars in the 27th Ward. It is going to bring a great many people and a great deal of business there. I know they will understand and they know that they can count upon you to get them another and even finer bathhouse. <laughs> this is actually not a picture of the bathhouse, as I said. Uh, this is one from elsewhere in Philadelphia, but of about the same date and general appearance as the one facing South Street, um, and might perhaps look like the, the um, even finer bathhouse that Mr. Patton would be getting uh, for the 27th Ward. So we had a site but what was the plan, as it were, for the building? Here again, Pepper steps up and sketched this little, first little plan of the building. Uh, Pepper, by the way, was a physician, and if you can't read his handwriting, uh, <laughs> now you know why. And it shows how a series of simple block-like wings around the grand hall that we can read could be erected over time at the west end of the site at the corner of 34th and Spruce or 33rd and South as it is now. He drew this up and he shared it with Mrs. Stevenson and joked that his little drawing was quite worthy of Michelangelo. <laughs> well, maybe so, but the museum's building committee decided, decided to hire real architects. Four architects all instructors in the university's new architecture program. Wilson Eyre, Walter Cope, in partnership with John Stewartson, and Frank Miles Day. All were in their 30s, and they were architects of a new stripe. They had put aside the vigorous, even violent character of Victorian design, typified by, for example, the work of Frank Furness, 
preferring to mix styles more gently, albeit freely. Cope and Stewartson were then working on the quadrangle men's dormitories at Penn, and Day would design Waitman Hall, the first Franklin Field, and with his partner, Charles Clauder, went on to build the two-tiered stadium, the second or third Franklin Field, depending on how you count, that we know today. Um, Day did the first masonry Franklin Field. There was, of course, wooden stands before that. So, um, Cope and Stewartson and Frank Miles Day had Penn associations. Ayer, however, had not yet built at Penn and made his reputation thus far uh, with city and suburban houses. Now, as they began, the architects tested a number of new stylistic alternatives that had been opened up by their generation. This is Day's sketch plan of 1894, the earliest surviving drawing drawn by an architect. And here we have a more fully developed plan and elevation showing that their first inclination was towards a heroic composition of classical domes and porticos in the Roman mode. And you can see from the very beginning that we were thinking big. Um, this Roman mode that had been popularized very recently by the so-called White City, the stupendous classical fairgrounds created for the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. But this grandiose vocabulary was clearly not the language of these young designers. And these perspectives by Clauder, by Charles Clauder, show that by 1895, they were tempering their high-blown antique rhetoric with the small-scale arcades and warm-tiled roofs of the Mediterranean. And vaguely, maybe, Rome, uh, sorry, Italy, Spain, the Mediterranean. And different, but fitting into this experimental spirit is this newly discovered blueprint. Um, you can see that it was folded up, um, and it, uh, this copy may actually have belonged to Sarah York Stevenson, and it just came to archives along with some other blueprints, most of which we'd already seen, this one we had not, uh, came to archives just a couple of years ago. By December of 1895, this stylistic experimentation had shifted a final time and settled on the Italian Romanesque. And the top one there, which we've seen before, uh, is 1896. <clears throat> and the others are a similar date. Loosely interpreted, this is a vocabulary that characterizes the building that was constructed beginning in 1897. Wilson Eyre seems to have catalyzed this revolution this resolution, borrowing brickwork domes and arcades from the great 11th century monuments of Milan. Here, Santa Maria della Grazia on the left and Sant'Ambrogio on the right. And the distinctive marble door hood, and you see it um, uh, in a photograph of the museum with rather scrawny trees and bushes, so it's quite early, um, so soon after 1899. So that distinctive marble door hood um, might have been inspired by the side portal of Santa Alessandro in Lucca. You see it as it is at the top, and a page from Ayer's scrapbook. Um, it's just an image that he post pasted in his scrapbook. So instead of cool, smooth, classical forms, Ayer accentuated warm colors, rough textures, and handicrafts. And the result was a splendid, eclectic artifact of the arts and crafts movement with curved eaves inlaid with Tiffany glass mosaics and walls decorated with marble, stone, and brick mosaics. This is just a sample. And I, oh no, the, and the one on the, um, sorry, lower right there. Maybe you can see right here. That's my favorite, that's a walrus. Um, the architect specifically ordered dark, elongated bricks, directing that they be laid in an unusual pattern called double Flemish bond, two stretchers between every pair of headers, and you can see that in the brick detail, which accentu accentuated the horizontals. The jointing was specified to be wide and the mortar to be coarse and tinted between each pair of stretchers to make it seem like a single very long brick. Again, all intended to make the result seem handmade, arts and crafts. 
Evolving steadily through this period of stylistic experimentation was the museum's colossal master plan, which you see the plan of the master plan at the bottom there. And of course, that's the perspective we've seen before. With three imposing domes connected by exhibition galleries, each dome presided over its own courtyard, an arrangement that allowed the vast project to be constructed in self-sufficient pieces. And that was a very important part of the um, directions to the architects from the beginning. And indeed, the first phase consisted only of the structure surrounding the westernmost courtyard, and you see that here. This was inaugurated on December 20th, 1899, on the eve of the 20th century. William Pepper did not live to see it. He had died the year before. This is a series about our stuff. And now, before we continue with the development of the museum building, which is focused on exteriors, let us go inside and see what this new building looked like and how our stuff was displayed. We will look at galleries on what we now call the second and the third floors. The two side wings culminate in two double height spaces named, as it happens, for prominent Philadelphians. The Elkins Library, which of course is now Museum Archives, and the Widener Lecture Room, which is still the Widener Lecture Room. We will enter through the main entrance, marked as entrance, walk up the exterior stair, and in through the wooden doors. We come to the landing between the second and the third floors, which you see here in two slightly confusing, basically two halves of the stairway. And you can see, by the way, those globes on the stairs uh, that uh, Dan was talking about. And those of you with eagle eyes will notice that high up on the walls hang the master plan and the watercolor perspective we've just been looking at. You can see that here and here. Actually, the perspective is not the one we've been looking at. This one is lost, um, we just um, but it was essentially the same. So you would see the, the uh, plan and the perspective and that a reminder of what might be, perhaps with the help of your dollars. We're fortunate to have a series of photographs of the museum interiors from its first decade that show almost every space. We also have a short contemporary account, kind of a walkthrough, published in 1899, but it's written in the future tense. And I'll read that as we look at the images of the galleries. I should say that the author uses some terminology that we would not now use. So, entering the building through the quadrangle, one finds oneself, sorry, one finds himself, told you, upon a spacious stairway landing, whence he may ascend to the second or principal exhibition floor or descend to the first floor of the building. We'll go down to the first or second floor. The first floor is almost entirely devoted to exhibition rooms, the central gallery of the first floor will contain objects from Central and South America. This is the area where the Harrison, stair, Harrison Auditorium stairs would later be installed and then la just last year be removed to create a space like what we see here. The large room adjoining um, will be devoted to the exhibition of ethnological objects of Asiatic origin. And that refers to the first room on the right the first room of our new Middle East galleries, but we have no photograph of it in its earliest days. What we do have is this amazing series of photographs of the cases that were designed and installed in 1909 in the first two rooms, specifically for the George High Collection of North American Ethnology, as it was called. Here you see the cases, here you see the collection in those same cases. We were clearly very proud of those cases. Um, we don't know who the man is. But these, but these empty cases remind us of a sad museum story. The stupendous collection was on display at the museum from 1910 until 1917 when, when High took it all back to form his own museum in New York. Much of it is now at the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, but we lost it but I, we still got the cases. <laughs> but back to our account. 
Now the high collection was also in the corner gallery, so the first two galleries of the Middle East galleries. But originally in the room in the southwestern corner, so at the very beginning, was Professor Maxwell Somerville's valuable collection of engraved gems. You see him um, on the right in a portrait where he's showing off some of his collection of gems, and we, have, we can identify the, um, his collection in that, in that portrait. The other image shows him in another guise, dressed to serve as what one can only call a prop in the last gallery with his collections of objects connected with Buddhist worship. Lots of objects. A totally immersive experience. Uh, can you find him there? <laughs> He's right there. <laughs> And he clearly wasn't always a silent prop, <clears throat> for we know he gave sort of demonstrations in his gallery as well. So if we, if we carried on from here, we'd be in the Widener Lecture Room. So now we're going to go back uh, again to the main hall. And to the eastward is a room in which we'll be lodged, again, it's in the future, the collections illustrative of the life of the Colorado cliff dwellers and other American aborigines. Um, and... Um, this is a photograph taken a few years after the museum opened. And this, of course, is where Native American Voices is now. We continue. The extreme eastward corner room will be devoted to the collections which Dr. W.H. Furness, Dr. H. Sorry, Furness, Dr. H. M. Miller, and Mr. Alfred C. Harrison Jr. have recently brought from Borneo and adjacent islands. This is a stupendous collection, um, which sadly now is not on display, but it's really an amazing collection. And here's another view of the Borneo Gallery. And again, this gallery is where our new Central, um, sorry, our new Central American galleries will be. And here on the, oops, sorry. Here we have, uh, through the arch doorway, um, leading to the room um, immediately to the north of this, which will be occupied by a splendid collection of musical instruments presented to the university by Mrs. Frischmuth and by Mrs. Drexel's collection of fans. And here are Mrs. Frischmuth and Mrs. Drexel in portraits painted by Thomas Aikens with their musical instruments and their fans. And one sees the musical instruments in, and fans in what one can only hope is a staged photograph of the gallery. Um, again, um, this gallery, by the way, is the mirror of the Dietrich Gallery on the west side of the building, so the last room of the Middle East galleries. Um, and it is the archives corridor, which became offices at some point, maybe in the 1920s. So that Archives Corridor was originally actually the Rose Farron Gallery, and that's where the fans and the musical instruments were. Okay, we retrace our steps again back to the landing where we came in, and we continue up the stairs to the third or the second floor, or whatever you want to call it. And here, upon the second floor, he finds himself in the great central hall with Greek and Roman sculpture, both original and plaster casts, a junior size Nikkei of Samothrace, you can see there on the right, and the full size casts of the sculpture from the Roman Arch of Trajan at Benevento. You might be able to read, maybe, um, behind the light fixture, it says William Pepper Hall, um, and that is a bust of him uh, directly below, right, right there. So this was in his honor. Again, he died before the museum opened. A few years later, the same gallery got some more casts. Here, particularly prominently, the so-called Pompeian bronze reproductions given to us in the early 20th century, commissioned in 1902 by Philadelphia department store founder John Wanamaker. And you saw some of them all over the uh, main stair just a moment ago. To the westward, are two large rooms devoted to the display of objects secured by the various university expeditions to Babylonia 
And that, of course, are the galleries where the serious show was and the artifact lab was and will be coming back. And these, of course, were really our founding collections, the earliest material, um, uh, uh, the, the earliest in terms of, of our excavations. So really our founding collection. While to the east are similar rooms in which the Etruscan and Egyptian collections will be displayed, upon the level of this floor are also rooms for administration, for curators, and for instruction. This is the Etruscan collection, which also includes Greek material. And you can see here the vaulted spaces and the spine of skylights. Actually, you can only see one skylight, but there's one. There are others um, that characterize the third floor. And, and again, here too, this is the same gallery, but looking in the opposite direction. This is Canaan and ancient Israel a few years later, looking east rather than west lined up with the central feature in the Egyptian gallery, this column, this where the Roman gallery is now. Now the Egyptian collection was a lot smaller then, um, although there were the two big pieces, the column in the center and the statue of the seated Ramses II on the left, and you can see his head poking up above the cases. And again, a soaring vault and a large skylight. Electric lights hang from brackets on the ceiling. These were light-filled spaces, sometimes too much perhaps, because you may also notice that there are window shades. In 1911, when the university had at last gathered the resources to proceed, and after the architects had protested that the building as built was incomplete, visually certainly, without its rotunda, Wilson Eyre freshened up the design, as you see here, in a pencil sketch on a photograph of the rotunda above the now 10-year-old building. And the completed rotunda, seen here in 1916, gave a soaring strength to the building that it certainly had lacked. And this side view shows the geometric shapes and how the roof lines step up from the Widener Lecture Hall there on South Street to the corner pavilion to the block in front of the rotunda, and to the rotunda itself. Let's consider for a moment how they built the rotunda. The almost magical vault building system that makes possible a wide open auditorium, no bad seats behind columns, underneath a 90-foot dome. And you see a blueprint section of the rotunda, um, of the Harrison Wing, with the auditorium underneath and the rotunda, what we call the rotunda above. As the advertisement on the right reveals, the magic came from the structural system that was developed by a Barcelona emigre named Rafael Guastavino, whose son, also named Rafael, had inherited the business by the time our domes were built. The system, as you see here at the Boston Public Library, which was Guastavino's first important commission in the United States, was based on medieval, especially Catalonian, vernacular <coughs> structural methods of tile vaulting. It consisted of hard terracotta tiles, only one inch thick. Um, that's me with a very dirty hand holding uh, one, a broken one, a broken one, um, above the Harrison Auditorium. And they were held together with an unusually tenacious mortar to create what Guastavino called cohesive construction. You can see here on the left above my head um, the system in the space above the dome of the rotunda. It did not require the perfect fitting together of building blocks as in traditional stone vaulting or the enormous thickness of concrete vaults and it could be built without temporary supporting frame, framing, centering. The yellow arrows here and the top one is where I was standing in the previous slide. There's a ladder up there. Um, that slide was, image was taken quite a while ago. I'm not sure I could get up there now. But they help us see the extraordinary thinness of the dome and the shallow ceiling dome of the auditorium. And that shallow dome and the floor above it, of course, is the true engineering marvel. And the photographs of the two interiors of the rotunda and the auditorium are by Charles Sheeler, the Philadelphia-born and trained painter and self-taught 
photographer who took a marvelous series of images at the museum um, soon after the rotunda, the Harrison Wing opened. The images minimizing um, the already, uh, minimize the already modest richness of the auditorium's decor while emphasizing the austere, undecorated geometries of the rotunda. So this is the Harrison Wing Rotunda and Auditorium that we know, but the original rotunda planned to be built with the first phase, the foundations were even laid, was very different. So this is a blueprint section of the way it was to be originally. So the passage of time and a change of program, the auditorium on the lower level was not part of the original plan, led the architects to what we've just seen. The original plan called for a rotunda, and you can see it there, that was in fact literally a half-size pantheon in Rome, a half-size version of the, most, one of the most famous dome space of the ancient world, and you can see it's half. Rome is 144, Philadelphia is gonna be 72. It would, it, it would have even, it would car have carried on the simple classicism of the interiors, but in a rather mechanical, even pedantic way. The addition of the auditorium pushed the architects to rethink <clears throat> what held up the floor of the rotunda. The planned supporting piers of the original design would have, would have made a big lecture room impossible, and that pushed them to adopt the Guastavino system, and that in turn allowed them to increase the diameter and the height of the upper space to 90 feet. And all of these changes pushed the architects, probably led by Wilson Eyre, to reevaluate the now nearly decade old vocabulary for the interior. And the result is the austere brick hall that we know. The ceiling coffering and the classical details of the Pantheon, which you see in the famous Panini painting, have disappeared in favor of a simple <coughs> geometrical vocabulary of arches wall planes and dome. This, it must be said, is the same language as the Romanesque exterior, or at least an elemental related dialect. Indeed, perhaps it was a good thing that they had to wait more than a decade to build the Harrison Wing. In the years after the Harrison Wing opened, the museum's field work in Egypt helped increase the Egyptian holdings so that a new wing, the Cox Wing, was built to house it. And you see it um, here um, in, this draw, in this watercolor to the left of the rotunda. Named, as I said, for Eckley Brinton Cox, um, <clears throat> a very important supporter of the museum and its work in Egypt, it carried on the master plan and the style of the earlier wings. The and on May 19th, 1926, the new wing opened to the public. This is opening day. There were two floors of very large exhibition space made possible by the continued use of Guastavino vaulting. The interiors are austere, much in the spirit of the rotunda. There are side galleries for the display of smaller collections. On the upper floor, these side galleries are skylit, as you see here. It had been intended, of course, that the large architectural pieces from in and around, actually really in the complex of the Palace of Marin Ptah at Memphis, and we now know a lot more about this by taking apart um, the displays in Lower Egypt, they would be placed at full height in the upper gallery, again, as you see on the left. But there seems to have been a misunderstanding about floor loading, perhaps, unbelievably, because the architects called the upper gallery the third floor, while the museum thought of it as the second floor. It's hard to believe, but that's one explanation. The director of the museum at the time was George Byron Gordon. You see him here with his famous mustache. And on the right, the main hall and stairs of Philadelphia's Racquet Club. Only a year after the Cox Wing opened, Gordon fell down these stairs and died several days later. And um, it was a, it, he, he was an incredible director um, and it was a great loss to the museum. 
But in June of 1924, he was still alive, and he wrote to the architects about the misunderstanding. Clearly, there had been some shouting matches before that, because by June, Gordon begins his letter rather mildly. So something must have gone on before that. <clears throat> he says, I perceive that it will not be possible to install heavy exhibits on the main floor of the third section. I shall therefore arrange to have them placed on the lower floor. He goes on to, to ask advice for dealing with the problem the architects probably had not envisioned. He says, as I restricted on the main floor by the conditions for which the floor was designed, namely a limit of 200 pounds per square foot, I shall be guided by the limitation. I must, however, inform you that I am expecting in this main floor third section a visit from a lady who weighs 300 pounds. <laughs> My estimate is that each of her feet covers a floor space somewhat less than a square foot. When, therefore, she is standing on one foot, she will exert a pressure on the floor of 300 pounds per square foot, which, you will observe, is an excess of the limit allowed by you. I suppose that your engineer will be prepared to design some structure or apparatus by which the weight of the lady will be distributed in such a way that she may be transported across this floor with safety. There is, alas, no record of such a lady or her visit, <laughs> but we, we may assume, I think, that it was uneventful. All roads lead to Franklin Field when Penn and Navy play. So says the caption for this aerial view of Franklin Field and the surrounding area. The big day was November 6, 1927, and 78,000 fans packed Franklin Field. You can see the museum across the street, and at its east end, somewhere amongst the rows of cars belonging to the 78,000 fans, <clears throat> we see the newest wing of the museum, the administrative wing, under construction. The lead donor for the wing was Eldridge Reeves Johnson, museum board chair and founder of the Victor Talking Machine Company, but he did not wish it to be named for him. It would later sort of take on the name of the Sharp Wing after the Sharp Galleries on the third floor of the new wing. So we call it both. Actually, everyone calls it Sharp now. Administrative is just a little too generic. The wing opened in the fall of 1929. It's hard to imagine a more inauspicious time. And its austere exterior, especially in this stark photograph on the right, seems appropriate. There were many financial challenges in building the building. And clearly, uh, there was no money in the landscaping budget. <laughs> the planning for this wing went on at the same time as that of the Cox Wing, and the two actually have much in common. This was to be the main entrance to the museum, and the architects went through endless planning variations, <clears throat> although incredibly, almost 30 years later, still working in many ways from the 1896 master plan. And it was still um, some of the same architects some of them had died, and it was successor firms, but uh, some of the same architects as well. And here, too, as with the Cox Wing, we have the hands-on management of Director Gordon. The architects had proposed a welcoming portico, or a loggia, at the new entrance, such as you see on the left, and you can see the light coming through um, the arches uh, of the loggia, uh, showing its depth. In late November of 1925, Gordon wrote to Wilson Eyre, this is very important. Your proposed portico at the entrance, running up two stories, is open to the gravest objections. These objections are as follows. It shuts out the light from the entire center of the mezzanine floor and reduces the floor space. The only purpose that it serves is to enhance the exterior effect of the entrance from the courtyard. I do not say that this is not a good reason for having a portico, but it is certainly not sufficient reason for destroying the usefulness of the interior. We want a museum building, and we must have light. An overhanging ledge and columns in front of our principal windows on the northern exposure is not a situation that I can contemplate with satisfaction. This, therefore, is the serious problem to which you will have to give your attention. I suppose that you can either eliminate the portico altogether, or you can run it up one story only. 
Air writes back, arguing for the loggia, and Gordon answers that in part, I'm sure that all of you as architects will be even more impressed than I am with the serious defect in the lighting caused by this feature, a defect which you yourself emphasized at our last meeting, don't forget, and with which, I'm, and I'm, which I am quite familiar with in other museum buildings. Ayer came up with a brilliant solution that seems to have quieted Gordon and was acceptable to the architects. Still an imposing but welcoming two-story five-bay entrance, as you see here, but shallower. There is no loggia that destroys the usefulness of the interior. I've been stressing the austerity of the administrative wing, but there is decoration. The sculpture of the, of the doorways and Samuel Yellen gates in the courtyard entrances. The curved eaves are decorated with <clears throat> colorful ceramic tiles, probably designed by Air, but produced by the Philadelphia firm Nicola Descenzo Studios. And the gate posts are surmounted by remarkable sculptures for the new wing of the University Museum. Representing Asia, Europe, Africa, and the Americas, they are the work of Alexander Sterling Calder, who had as a young man done the marble shield over the main entrance of the 1899 wing. And as the clipping on the right shows, they were carved on location, working from plaster models on scaffolding 15 feet above the ground. Now it's interesting too that the administrative wing reflects contemporary practice in 1929, contemporary museum practice, in providing access to a wider audience. So the semicircular driveway provided a way for school buses to stop at the entrance doors. Indeed, the first floor of this wing would eventually be devoted to growing museum education facilities. On the third floor, there was a member's museum where members could fight off museum fatigue under the watchful eye of Sarah York Stevenson, and you see her portrait there on the left. And in the new Sharp Gallery, part of which you see here, there would be a new way of organizing collections. For here, only the choicest pieces of the museum's extensive classical collections are on public view. This is a description from a museum bulletin of the of 1930, and it goes on to say, so, so this was just the choicest pieces in these three galleries, um, and the one in the, that you see here in the foreground is our introduction to the classical world gallery, and behind you is the Etruscan gallery. So only the choicest pieces of the museum's extensive classical collection are on public view. The rest are installed in the classical study rooms, one of which you see here, which are being put to immediate use by the graduate students of Bryn Mawr, um, who meet there for their seminars. <laughs> and it is believed that by thus separating study material from that of more general interest, the collections will prove both more stimulating and comprehensible to the general public and more convenient for the specialist. In the years after World War II, the museum gradually awoke to its rather raggedy appearance at the East End. There's also construction going on, but it's um, where the Cox Wing on the left and the Sharp Wing <clears throat> on the right had been intended to meet in a grand rotunda. And in 1967, museum director Froelich Rainey hired the architect Romaldo Gergola to re-examine the museum master plan, now 70 years old, and build anew. So with the building of what we call the academic wing, um, the original master plan was essentially abandoned. This new wing would be built behind the administrative wing, so there at the right, and this photograph is at the start of construction uh, for the academic wing. Um, they are in the process of demolishing the uh, stair towers at the ends of the, of the wing. So it would be built behind the administrative wing and connected to the end of the Cox Egyptian galleries at the left, a kind of missing link. 
Now, Jergola, along with some other Philadelphia architects, was interested in broadening and enriching modern architecture, probably most significantly by reconnecting it to its historical roots. This generation was more respectful of the work of Wilson Eyre and his collaborators than earlier moder modernists would have been, and Jergola's new L-shaped wing created wonderful courtyards that engaged in a sort of dialogue between itself and the old buildings in an intimate, really respectful way. And that's a drawing by Jergola of those courtyards, the new building and the old building and in dialogue. Although the easternmost part of the proposed three courtyards was now sacrificed to a parking garage, the Jergola plan sought to reinforce the importance of the intended main axis with its entrance in the administrative wing. So aligned with that doorway, he built um, a new lobby, mosaic gallery down here, with cafe, of course, above. And straight ahead, where the, would be, have been the largest of the three rotundas that had been sketched in in the 1890s. And there he placed the most important spaces of the newly defined museum of the 1960s. <clears throat> a large lecture hall for classes, this one, and public events, and upstairs a library. This new academic wing, as Rainey envisioned it, and as it is, would have offices, classrooms, and laboratories for the university's expanded um, anthropology department and a larger research library. He also called for larger facilities for the museum's growing public education programs. Although we have long known the south facade of the building as masked by the Penn Tower, um, here Jurgola showed great appreciation for the architectural character of the earlier parts of the complex, creating exterior walls of brick and giving a tile roof that echoed the arts and crafts values of his predecessor. So this is the way it looked when it's open, when it opened, um, it was just a parking lot for the 78,000 fans. Well, it's probably fewer than 78,000 by the 60s. So we've gotten used to not seeing that side of the building, but there was a small window between the demolition of Penn Tower and its garage and the construction of the new patient pavilion, it was possible to appreciate that sensitivity again, and you see that on the bottom. We see sensitivity to earlier architecture, but of a different sort in the main wearing wing, the work of architects Atkin Olsen Lawson Bell, now Atkin Olsen Shade, with offices and state-of-the-art storage for our organic collections that closed off the fourth side of the courtyard, the Stoner Courtyard, in front of the administrative wing. It is enormously respectful, respectful of the older building, and its brickwork has the same thick mortar and double Flemish bond that we saw in the original 1899 building and thereafter. And we had a landscaping budget this time, and Olin Partners did the landscape design, just as the main wearing uh, sorry, I did the landscape design. Just as the main wearing wing was being completed, the warden garden was being dug up, as Dan mentioned, principally to provide the space for mechanical equipment that would be needed for the infrastructure upgrades of the 1899 building and further. And then we put the garden back. So we are back here to where we began, although, as you know, a huge project <laughs> which Dan mentioned, to renovate the Harrison Wing is well along, and a complete renovation of both the gallery spaces and the exhibitions in the Egyptian galleries is in its early stages. It is indeed a challenge, but also a joy, to work in this building and to learn about it. And I am very grateful to have had that opportunity, and I hope that some of that joy has come out of what I've said this evening. As we look at drawings and photographs, read other people's mail, gallop down terrazzo floored galleries, bolt up marble stairs, and ran around outside looking at glass mosaics and funny brick patterns. Thank you very much. I'll happily take questions, although I should 
hasten to add that I have a specialist in the audience who, who may, uh, may have to answer some of these questions. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Where do you put the material that you don't show? Um, well, you might have noticed in those uh, photographs of the 1899 building. Oh, sorry, I'm not loud enough. Um, everything was, it seemed that everything was on display. There are a few drawers and things in some of the cases, but mostly it seemed that everything was on display. And the more the better. If you had 10 examples of something, showing all of them would be 10 times as effective. Well, now we don't think that. <laughs> and perhaps only showing one of them is sufficient. So um, uh, subsequent to that, um, the, um, uh, the wings did have some collection storage space. For example, the Sharp Wing has two, a basement and a sub-basement for collection storage. The Cox Wing also has a place for collection storage. So it was recognized already then that you really didn't want to put everything out. So that's where it is. Uh, and some of it, of course, is in main wearing, but that's, again, mostly for the organic collections, uh, mostly the ethnographic material. Mm -hmm. Every picture of the interior that you showed us is, appeared to have electric lighting. When the building first was constructed and designed, was it designed and constructed with electric lighting? Indeed it was. Um, so Tina told me that I could not talk for three hours. So I had to cut out a lot of things. And one of them was a discussion actually of the lighting. You'll notice in some of those photographs that indeed there is electric lighting. And I think there are enough, uh, a number of them are clear enough that you could see that there are like lots of them um, because those were probably 15 watt bulbs or something. So they had quite a lot of them. Um, and um, it was in some ways a, a really ahead of its time. It was, would really be a couple decades later that um, uh, scholars of museum practice or practitioners of museum practice talked about how important it was to have electric lighting so that the museum could be open to people who worked and would want to come at night. Now, I don't think the museum would have looked so great at night, but you could certainly, uh, you, you could certainly see things. And that this was an important um, way of making the museum seem um, that it was really open to all. And um, the, um, the SHARP, the administrative wing, um, in thinking about how to arrange the objects in the museum was also thinking about that. So yes, indeed, there were electric lights. Um, you saw some of them, there were long um, sort of booms. Um, there were also uh, sort of frames with lights on them. They were all over the place. And um, yeah, they were all over the place. So there, indeed, there was a lot of electric lighting. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. It was there from the beginning. Um, and actually, you, you won't have noticed this probably as I stare at these things all the time. The two views that I had of the Egyptian gallery uh, in the Roman gallery, one of them shows the lights in place, and another photograph shows them not there yet. You can see the holes where they're going to attach it, but, the, but that um, horizontal piece with the lights is not there yet. So I think... Um, also, uh, that column went to Lower Egypt, and in taking apart the things in Lower Egypt, they discovered well, the top of it, this plaster of that column, which was it's fairly obvious in the photograph, but it has the initials of presumably the plasterer in the top, and it says 1900. So um, it opened in December of 1899, but I don't think everything was ready yet. So. Um, that 1900 carved in the plaster and the fact that the lights are only in one of those photos makes me think that they really hadn't finished everything quite yet. I'm pretty curious about the uh, lighted glass flooring in the, um, I guess it's in the Roman gallery and then above, I guess it's also in Pepper, um, and whether those were originally put in. Um, we didn't get too many images of the floors. Yes, um, <clears throat> and that was another thing that I didn't really talk about because I talked about the skylights on the third floor, but those, um, um, 
those, that glass paving, which is in the two corner galleries, so what's now the Artifact Lab and the Roman Gallery, and um, um, uh, uh, Pepper, are each above skylights. And the idea was that light would come from the skylight through that glass into the lower floors. There was certainly an awareness in the beginning that the lower floors were uh, darker because they didn't have the soaring vaults and all the windows. So that was one way of bringing light. Um, the glass tile has certainly been, um, oh, sort of darkened and made cloudy over the years. It was never, you know, like a glass window pane, but I think more glass, more light would have gotten through uh, than is there now. And by the way, the, um, in the Roman gallery, there's the huge um, uh, relief of, um, uh, from uh, Pozzuoli, the big Roman relief, which is in the same place as the Egyptian column. And um, there is a lot of steel support under those glass tiles. It is not sitting only on glass tiles unsupported underneath it. So there was structure to support the column, and eh, maybe not quite enough. And we put up, we put even more uh, when we put the Roman uh, relief there. So yes, indeed, those were part of the, the skylights and bringing light into the lower levels. Yes. Yep. Yeah, that was part of it from the very beginning. Oh, in the floors. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, no. Um, um, it w that was done later to sort of liven them up a little bit, but then they discovered that maybe they were a little too bright. Because, of course, the skylights, you may say, where are the skylights? The skylights were covered by a roofing project that was done um, around the second time of the Second World War. So the skylights um, disappeared, and all we have left are what we call the lay lights, so the interior part of the skylight. Um, so, um, so we've attempted to kind of reconstruct them, but not enough light comes down. So you really lose the effect entirely of the glass, um, of the light coming through the glass to the lower floors. To be honest, I'm not sure how success successful it is. Remember these guys were in their 30s? And we think that maybe they, you know, they had some ideas and maybe, yeah. So, but anyway, it's a lovely idea and, um, and certainly has vestiges here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.